And our guest today is uh, my old high school uh, classmate, Stephen Talischek from the east side of Bridgeport. Uh, Stephen, tell us a little bit about what you remember about the east side in your early days. What was the east side like? You know, the east side was a great neighborhood. Um, it had everything that you needed from an adult perspective, from my parents who had you know, come over from Europe, World War II in 1948, everything that they wanted, uh, everything that I needed as a kid. We had plenty of places to go see the movies. If you wanted pizza, fish and chips, uh, you knew which liquor stores you could go to when you were Where was underage. the nearby theater? The American, right on East Main Street. You right remember near, that, the American? Uh, near Shelton. I remember that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, fifty cents. You get movie the movies all afternoon, Saturday afternoon, and uh, popcorn and soda. And what supermarket on the east side? Oh well, we had a whole bunch of them. I mean, we had First National over on Boston Avenue. We had Gemma's Market on East Main Street. We had Lucy's, which was the little uh, you know, Italian market. We had the Green Grocer across the street from wow. that. We had Ann's Bakery, Swirling's so Bakery. So there was if no you food wanted. desert back then. No, no. And there was no super stop and shops either. We had the A&P a little bit further down on Boston Avenue. We had First Nationals, you know, and, and plenty of, you know, with the chicken market down the street on Brook chicken, Street. Live chickens? Absolutely right. You want something for Thanksgiving, you want a turkey, you go pick the bird out. Next thing you know, he's on your table, still fresh. Was the neighborhood you were in, was it an ethnic neighborhood? It was uh, it was pretty ethnic. Um, it, it was kind of, you know. We what were, street were you on? Yeah, you know, I was on the corner of Ogden and Brook. Now okay. we were you know I'm Polish, obviously. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of Eastern Europeans, Ukrainians over in my exact neighborhood, but I'm on the corner of Ogden and Brook, one block over so on the corner up. of Ogden. You were on the other side of the railroad tracks. Oh yeah, you were the north of the railroad tracks. Well beyond you know okay. St. Michael's and Pulaski Street. Yeah, okay. I was a block away from St. Charles, which really had a, con a religious congregation that was mainly Irish. So you were as a as a Polish person, you were a little further outside of your comfort zone. You weren't in the St. Michael's neighborhood. Right? Was it mostly St. Michael's were the No, nah, you know was? what? It wasn't like that. Hmm. There were people, you know, within blocks. Another, if I go a block the other way on Brook Street, we had St. John the Pomacy. And I go two blocks down on Arctic Street and we had St. John the Baptist. You know, we had all these different churches. They they had their populations. It was a very mixed ethnic population, mostly European, you know, uh, but not all European. And it was it was fantastic. We had the old mill green. You can play over there. Get on your bicycles and go down to Beardsley Park Thursdays, Thursday evening. Mom, get on the bus or walk because we did a lot of walking back in those days. And and you know, we went down to uh, downtown for all the shopping. Did a lot of window shopping, kind of thing. I remember being the 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 first. My father had the first television remote control. It was me. He'd say, change the channel. I'd have to get up and change the channel. That was it. That's the way it worked. You know, That's right. My, my aunt, on the, we lived in a two-family house. Black my, and white or color? Oh, absolutely. Black and white. Black and white. My aunt downstairs, I had two aunts and my grandfather lived downstairs, and uh, she had a color TV. So we were allowed wow. every now and then to go downstairs and watch color. Mid-60s. For, for some, uh, yeah, late 50s, early 60s. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, and everything went off at midnight, you know, with the the uh, Star Spangled Banner and the flag waving. And then if you got up early enough in the morning, 6 o'clock, you'd get the farm report. It was a different world. And what, what were the kids doing? Uh, were there fist fights and bicycles of course there and were. everything? There were fist fights, and you'd throw rocks at each other, <laughs> and you'd throw snowballs at trucks, and you'd put ash cans and garbage cans and see how high you can blow the lids off. It was all harmless fun. You know, kind of thing. Today, you know, eh, people wouldn't look story. at it the same way. It's a different story. But we, you know, like I said, we get on our bicycles. We'd go down six, eight blocks. We're over at the old Mill Green. That was where we played football all the time. Right. Long and narrow right. kind of thing. You go a couple more blocks, and you're over over on uh, Asylum Street, and you're at the Little League field. 
And so you play Little League Baseball over there, you know, kind of thing. Never realized that in the in August after, you know, you don't have any school, you're going to play a game, it's hot and everything, and you go down to this little creek that ran, you know, from way up in what we used to call the Remington Woods property, ran down. Today, you know, we get connects into the Yellow Mill. Right. Uh, you know, I've learned. And, uh, you know, you'd go down there and you'd cool off, and you would really didn't understand why today the creek is running blue, tomorrow it's you running red. You actually went into the creek? Yeah. Really? I mean, it wasn't deep. It was a couple of, you know, uh-huh. maybe a foot deep, a couple of three, six feet wide. Is that near the uh, cemetery there? Well, it's it's north of the cemetery, right in back of, if you go due east from the Little League fields, down right. where the Pony League right. field is. Where down Park the, City Little League used to be. Where Park City, you, uh, correct. The Pony League field on the bottom. Pony uh, League field on yeah. the bottom. right? Which is right not over there the, anymore. All that's no, no, that's not there anymore. That's all being redeveloped. And the Little League field is going up on top over there. Right. Um, General Electric, who is a good corporate citizen, has decided that they were going to you know, do the environmental remediation. Since you know they created the problem, they were going to clean it up. And uh, one way that's allowable is to cap things. So they took a lot of the contaminated material from around the, their whole site, and they had a lot of territory all the way over to, you know, the million square foot building they had on Boston Avenue, uh, you know, right at Bond Street. Well, they take all the environmentally contaminated material, put it in a pile, and then put a cap on it. It meets all the federal and state standards for environmental remediation. Well, let's go back to your childhood there. Oh, my childhood. Yeah. yeah. So We don't uh, worry about the environmental who, who remediation. Who might we know today from your childhood back in that neighborhood? Oh, boy. Who might we know today from my childhood? Wow. Who was the priest that uh, used to be at uh, what high, what grammar school did you go to? Um, uh, you know, I went to Garfield for a year, and then I went to St. John the Baptist. Monsignor Dole and I uh, was the Monsignor that I remember over there. Father Tom, I don't remember what his name was. He was the the young guy, you know, kind of thing. And who did you um, hang out with? What what groups did you hang out with? Yeah, different people from. Different areas, you know. My brother was a year older, so we had a lot of friends in common. We went to school together. We all went to the same schools. So, you know, we started off over at St. John the Baptist, and then from St. John the Baptist, my brother and I, as you, you know, mm-hmm. went, went to Colby. Right. Uh, you know, kind of thing. When Colby was only a boys' school, you know, kind of thing. It was mostly Polish, right? And and uh, yeah. African-Americans and Puerto Ricans were starting to participate or go to that school. Yeah, yeah, I mean it was it was a great school, and you know, and I look around today and I see different people from yeah you know, Colby High School who have, where Bridge Academy is today, where Bridge Academy is today, mm-hmm. yep, and uh, you know everybody is doing well. well. I think we got a good education kind of thing. You didn't mess around with you know any of the uh, the Franciscan friars. You know there were reasons they had those knots in their rope. I mean a whap. And uh, and Father George, you know, he was a boxer before he came in, yeah. before he became a priest, um, and you know, you didn't mess with him. Otherwise, he'd knock you down. Right. Okay. I'm sure Frank Fusey, yeah. who you know, another great great guy, you know, kind of thing. Uh, you know, over the years, you learn who these people were as you get older, and the different businesses that they have, and what they did, you know, outside of being your teacher, kind of thing. Was so. it valuable to have been a part of Colby High School as a youth? Uh, was it valuable? You know, I think it was. And, and I think that, you know, there's less pressure, you know, sort of on you when you don't have to worry about how's my hair today? Am I wearing the right pair of sneakers? No girls right? in the school. Yeah, no girls. And nobody cared about fashion because, you know, everybody's wearing the same damn colored shirt, right. pants and jacket. Okay, the only flexibility is with ties, and so I got all my grandfather's, all the real wide ties, and I used to piss off the, the priest because, you know, that would be my rev- revolution. I'd wear funny ties. Right. So right. it was a, you know, it was a good life. Patches I, on the elbows. Uh, on the jackets. Well, if they weren't there when you started, mom sewed them on yeah. because, you know, you wore through it. You didn't throw it away. We weren't as disposable as we are today. So and was, um, and that was, those were the days of Walter Luckett and the great basketball team. Walter Luckett, stuff. Tommy Boken, yeah. yeah, the great basketball teams. Yeah. That funny shot that Luckett had right. over the back kind of thing. James which, Cox. and Jimmy Cox, yeah. And all those guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then uh, what happened after high school? What happened after high school? Uh, well, after high school, you know, I went to the University of Connecticut mm-hmm. uh, over in stores kind of thing, spent uh, about a year over there, and, and I really wasn't 
in the mood to, for me, college was someplace I wanted to go to learn about things that I wanted to learn. I didn't really fall into the regimen of mm -hmm. you must take this and you must take that and everything else. Um, so I lasted a year over in stores. And then, uh, you know, I got into, you know, I'd always been working with my hands. And, you know, my aunt and my mother were, were seamstresses. And so I knew how to sell. I turned into an upholsterer. I went to the upholstery really? training school. This is something we don't know about. In, you, uh, in New York City. It was on Waverly Place, right in the middle of the village. Really? And I lived there for about four or five months with uh, another friend of mine, Tom Wojtek from Bridgeport, who still is in the business. And, um, and we learned how to do furniture, upholstery, slip covers, and things like that. And uh, so that's what I did. And then oh. I went back to school both between the uh, Norwalk Community College and UConn Stamford. So the upholstery thing didn't take. Well, you know what? Like I said, I enjoyed working with my hands. I ended up starting a business on Wall Street in Norwalk. The business did well. But after a while, yeah, I couldn't work anymore. All I had to do was run the business. And that's not what I enjoyed doing. I enjoyed working on things, being creative with my hands. And instead, I turned into a salesman. I said, this isn't any fun anymore. I went back to school, you know, history and library sciences and, and continued, continued that. And uh, eventually, I don't know, you know, had that business until 1982, no, about, I think 1985, 86. I, uh, I finally closed that business down. You know, kind of thing and started working for Neighborhood Housing Services. Ah, oh, NHS. In the South End. Good old NHS. Is that Bill Finch? Bill Finch was there, Bob Halstead, um, Dana Erlbacher, where was, where were Guy the Horvath. My office was uh, 37 Myrtle Avenue because I was in the South End. Oh, you're in the South End. There were other programs in the West Side, Dave Colleen. So that was out of a house, NHS? Yeah, it was out of a, uh, out of a UB house. Um, and, you know, UB owned a lot of houses over there. They had them over there on Myrtle Avenue. And some people used to call that Teacher's Row. Because mm -hmm. what they did with all these old Victorian houses over there, they would rent them out to the teachers. Teachers needed some place to live, too. And so they had this whole conglomerate, half dozen, eight houses maybe, and they all had teachers in them. Uh, so we did a lot of work in NHS trying to you know, revive the neighborhood. And, you know, that really started my, my you know, kind of social uh, advance uh, to working to you know, fix my city. And, uh, and since that time, I've continued to do that. How long were you with the NHS? Uh, I was with NHS. I started off on the board, I think, in 1982. And I think I started working for them in 1985. And I spent about five years with them. Then I went to the downtown. I was the second executive director after Lenny Grimaldi, plug for OIB, yeah. um, of the uh, downtown special services district. So um, for, uh, three at NHS, years. you you mentioned some Hall of Fame names: uh, Dana Earlbacher, who I worked with at the Bank Mart. That's right. Mike Guy Freeman Horvath was also at the Bank Mart. He was on the board, right? And uh, Guy Horvath, who was a, a really good architect, right? And he still is, and he's in Southport working for I don't recall the firm right now. And he but, lives right up the street here. Yeah, and in, yep. in uh, the Brooklawn section. Right. And you mentioned Bill Finch, who was our mayor. Bill Finch, and then. Uh, uh, Bob Halstead. Bob Halstead. And who's, uh, Keith uh, Cryan. Everybody knows uh, Bob. Right. Dave Colleen. Keith Cryan, right? Um, wow, that's a great group. Yeah. They all went on to do other things. They went on to do very good things. And what did you do? What did you, uh, when things. you left there, what happened? Well. And by the way, you already knew your wife. You were already married at this point. Yeah, I got married like in 77. So you were a married young kid. Yeah, I guess so. Relatively speaking. Relatively speaking, yeah. Had a, had a couple kids of your own? Uh, not until 85 and 88. 88, okay. Uh, anyway, I left that Living NH where? Where were you living at the um, time? At that point, I was living in the South End. We South were End. urban pioneers when okay. the South End was revitalized. That was a great time. Austin it Street was Saloon. Austin Street, the coach house over there at UB. Um, you had... Um, Oh, the Merry Widow. Yep. Uh, don't forget the blue wow, teapot. The, the Merry, the blue teapot. We had to step down you into had to go it, down. right? Yeah. yeah Is that yeah. a Hungarian restaurant? Yeah, it was a part? great black break. Yeah, a great breakfast place. Mm -hmm. And then over by UB, over on the end of Main Street, you had Conti's. Um, you had there were like three different Kingsman, Kingsman Pub. Pub. Yeah. 
Okay, and a couple other bars over there yeah, that I'm sure. probably, you know, I don't the know. The Bug I, Light, I think it was called, or some Limelight. I it was. Yeah, like Limelight. I I don't know. They're, but anyway, so you uh, ended up going to what? After I left NHS, I applied for a job with the Downtown Special Services District. Okay. And um, yeah, I got the job with the Downtown Special Services District, and I was the executive director of that for pre Bob Keeley. Pre Bob Keeley. Oh yeah. 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 No, the the only one before me was Lenny Grimaldi. Okay. Okay. And uh, I guess Tom Busey was. Is that about right? Tom Busey, mm -hmm. I think, was mayor, mayor. back then. Yeah. And uh, Lenny Grimaldi was working for Tom Busey. Mm -hmm. So he moved over to City Hall to work with Tom Busey. They had an opening over there, and it was kind of funny because as I was going into my interview over at the Business Council office, I kind of thing was it Roy O'Neill, I think, in charge of Business Council in those mm -hmm. days? Um, yeah, who's coming out of an interview but Bill Finch? As I'm coming out of my interview, who's going into, into the interview? Uh, Bob Keeley, you know, kind see. of thing. And, uh, you know, one day I get a call from Ernie Trevs that says, you know, we really like you, but do you think you can cut your ponytail? And I said, <laughs> Ernie, you know, not a problem. You know, I appreciate you, you know, mentioning it. I wasn't going to cut my ponytail. I remember those days. Because that's if right. that's you all you ponytail. guys were looking at, then I don't want to work for you. Yeah, right. Okay? Right. But you can get me on the pony table, and, you know, you've got the, the, the hood spot to uh, ask me to cut my ponytail. And I said, hey, you know, not a problem. That's great. And uh, so I spent about three years with the downtown special services district kind of thing. And then took a few years off and, you know, raised children. Okay. At that point, you know, the kids okay. were getting a little bit, bit bigger because yep. 88 and... Uh, and your wife was employed. My wife was working full time. Yeah, we, you know, we always needed to be a two income household in order to make ends meet. Yep. You know, kind of thing. Um, you know, living on Black Rock Avenue. Yeah. And, uh, you know, continue to stay involved with the neighborhood, created the Division Street Neighborhood Association, uh, a program that we called Neighbors Helping Neighbors, trying to get people to help each other. Um, worked on the uh, Gateway to the Sound project. That was the first project in the city of Bridgeport in 1985 to uh, build the, you know, brick esplanades and put in the Washington Post uh, lights, the Victorian-looking lights, uh, right. as they have in Washington, D.C., or right. why they're called Washington Post fixtures, you know, kind of thing. Um, and, you know, spent a little bit of time doing, you know, some consulting work. And, We're talking you know, about early 90s? Yeah, the early 90s. Okay. Doing uh, after 93, you know, in 95, started the Burroughs Community Center, worked on worked on that, you know, worked with another local architect, David Barber, on projects like a battered woman shelter, or some other stuff with the YMCA, YWCA, um, did some grants writing on the state level and, and got these projects going. And then, you know, in the afternoon, I would still, you know, go pick up the kids from school, et cetera. And then, uh, you know, trim the roses in the backyard and play with the kids. Were you Those just starting life. your fife and drum interests? Oh, no. My fife and drum interest goes back to the Colby High School Minute, Minute Men and uh, good old Richard Ryan. Richard Ryan, Richard right. Richard Ryan, who passed away and several so years ago now. the guy with the patch on, on his arm? No. Oh. no. Who is Richard Ryan? Richard Ryan was a Latin teacher. Galias divisa en partes tres. Oh, which means? Uh, all divided in three parts. Okay. Okay, so, um, yeah, I mean, that's the days when we used to build catacombs inside the uh, classrooms, you know, for parents' teacher night or whatever. So were you a drummer, flu flutist? I was a, uh, well, if it's a fife and drum corps, you don't have flute. So I, I was a fifer. 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 called, yep. Okay. Yep, and continued, you know, with with the, the hobby, with the fife and drum corps. Mm-hmm traveled all over you know we took school buses from bridgeport to williamsburg virginia okay with the fife and drum corps and those days you know it, the south was not like it is today it was totally different um it was you know very eye-opening to look at the country at that early age you know Mm -hmm. I'm in high school. When am I? 16, mm -hmm. 17, and uh, wow. seeing the country from the from a bus ride didn't have all the interstates that we have today, kind of thing. And of course, you know, buses never go over about was that what, in the summertime you said? miles an hour. <sighs> I don't even remember when it was. How long a trip was? Were we talking about weeks, days? No, months? it was a three or four day trip. Oh, okay. 
you know, that kind of thing. That's so fun. So it was uh, it was a lot of fun, but you know, it got me interested because you know everybody around us, my parents, you know, they came from the generation that fought and won one World War Two. You know, fife and drum corps. Connecticut has always had a history of that yield fifes and drums. You know, starting in Connecticut, and there used to be thousands of fife and drum corps members and hundreds of various corps. Every school had their own. I mean, it it was it was. Great time, good time. When did you uh, start working for the city? I started working for the city in 1996. Okay. Um, yeah, I get a call from Mike Freemuth one day, and yeah, once enough, I want to want to work for the city. I'm going, well, I'm like, I don't know. You know, it's like I never really thought that I wanted to work for the city, that yeah, kind of thing. I go, what do you need? What do you want to do? He goes, well, you want to build a ballpark? I'm going, well, that sounds like fun. Yeah. Yeah, you know, never did that before. You know, so he had the hook. Now he's reeling me right in. Okay. Right. And uh, reeled me right in. Next thing you know, it's history. I worked for the city for 17 and a half years. Uh, did most of the major capital uh, construction projects. You know, created the sports and entertainment area, built the ballpark. Not sad to see it go. Had a 20-year run. That was good. Look forward to the amphitheater. Built the arena. The arena's doing good. The transit garage next door. The walkways. Bus terminal. You know, did improvements to the Klein. You know, a whole bunch of other little projects along the way. And uh, I think, you know, had a fairly successful career, you know, working um, you know, for the city and, and, and helping improve the city. What was the most frustrating thing about working for a municipality? Uh, well, I yeah. say that because it's a leading question. I know. Well, I know, but you said we have what fifteen minutes. We're almost done. I, I, I mean, it would take me fifteen <laughs> hours. <Yeah. laughs> okay, so let's, let's let's skip just leave over it at that. that. One. All right. So, what pulled you away? Tell me about Steel Point. Well, you know what? Steel Point was going to be something new. Steel Point was going to be something big. Steel Point was something that I saw happening, you know, not in my office at City Hall, but the office next door run by a guy, Ed Lavernowich, yeah, you know, kind of thing. And uh, that started in around 2000. And it was the Conroy Project. It was the Harbor Point Project. It was all these different names. But everybody wanted to do something with all this old industrial property on the mouth of Bridgeport Harbor. And what are you going to do with it and so you know like i said others you know, wrote requests for proposals and these guys from miami who developed you know, uh an old railroad yard and some other stuff in miami on the waterfront submitted you know in response to the rfp and they got the job it was called rci um, you know robert christoph incorporated they created a local entity called bridgeport landing development kind of thing. And I was working with them, with Bridgeport Landing, in around 2010, uh, 2012, when Barack Obama became president. He created the Tiger Infrastructure Program, tra uh, Transportation Improvements Generating Economic Recovery. And in order to develop an area, you know, 52 acres on Steel Point, you needed to put all new infrastructure in there. We had gas pipes in there that were leaking that were 100 years old. The telephone wires string, strung all over the place. We had old industrial sites that had so much contamination because they used to be power plants. You know, steel used to be made on Steel Point, ergo the name Steel Point. Okay, there used to be iron works over there. It was never open to the public. It was always an industrial area. So I was tasked with writing the grant application for the Tiger Grant to the federal government because hey, I was doing a lot of grants writing with the city on all these other projects that I've already mentioned. We got the grant. I had to manage the, manage the grant. So I'm down there managing the grant and managing the construction project because Freemont had this attitude, if you're going to do something, you're take, taking care of it all. Mm -hmm. Okay, which, you know, I like working that it's way. your responsibility. Totally my responsibility. Okay, if it's an audit issue, it's my problem. If it's a construction issue, it's my problem. You know, it, it's all mine. Okay, I got nobody else to blame. 
So I had a great time doing that, got the roadways in. And then, you know, one day I'm, I'm talking to, after a meeting, I'm talking to the development uh, director, vice president of development for uh, Bridgeport Landing, a guy by the name of Mark Summers. And yeah, he tells me how he's going to have to hire somebody because he just can't handle everything by himself. You know, okay, we got the roadways done, but now we have to raise the elevation of the entire peninsula nine feet in order to meet the new FEMA regulations. In order to do that, we've got to put in a new bulkhead. In order to do that, we've got to do dredging. We need structures and dredging permits. We need this. You know, there's a whole bunch of complications that people don't think about when you're trying to redevelop an old city and turn it into a city for the future. And, uh, you know, so he's mentioning that. And before he left my office, I said, well, Mark, let me know when you're putting out a request, you know, kind of thing. You know, I'll probably throw a resume at you. And he looks at me and goes, really? I'm going, yeah. I said, I've had 17 and a half years over here, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, I'm, you know I, I love working on big projects. That's, that's what, it, what I do. You know, so far we've gotten along working together for two and a half years. No problem there. Mm -hmm. And so the next thing you know, you know, I send them uh, uh, my resume you know, from home, not from the office. Send them a resume when I get home. I later find out he never got it. Uh, I think that was a Thursday. On Saturday, he calls me and says that uh, Mr. Kristoff's gonna gonna call Mayor Finch and tell Mayor Finch that I'm leaving. And I said, "Really? Can you wait a couple of days and do that? Because you know I'm not ready for that. And don't we have to talk about a couple of things?" Um, when am I starting? What am I getting paid? What's my job responsibility? Right. You know, Mark, come on, you know. He goes, okay. So he hangs up kind of thing. And, um, you know, I call him back and I go, well, when do you want to get together and work out those details? And um, he goes, well, what are you doing now? <laughs> so the next thing you know, I, okay, jump in the car. I'm, you know, living in, all the way in in, in the uh what do you call it, in the South End over on Black Rock Avenue, I get in my car and I go all the way to Steel Point. Okay, and Mark lives on a boat over there. He opens up a bottle of wine. Two hours later, we got a deal. Oh, that's good. We took care of it all. Okay. Um, then on uh, on Monday, I get a letter from uh, Mr. Kristoff, you know, you know, which is uh, a uh, official. A, the 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 official, you know, we'd like to hire you, you know, my 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 job um, letter. And so I got that and said, okay, but wait a minute, can we hold off on telling the mayor? Can you let me clean up a couple of things I want to finish around here before you know I make this change. And uh, that's pretty much the way it happened. I made the change, and there's no looking back. And since that time, you know, we've gotten several other grants that I've been responsible for. Uh, when when you work. come back to this show, I'd like to talk to you in uh, with, Who said I'm coming with, back? <laughs> with, in detail about Steel Point, uh, opportunities there, and the casino uh, proposal and everything else going on. That's going to be really, really exciting. But this is uh, today about you. So tell me, uh, tell our audience something about you that they would not know. That might be interesting to them. Uh, well, let's see. I already told you that I'm a fifer. I play fife. Right. They probably wouldn't know no, that. No, they would not have known that. that. Um, in a you had a ponytail. I had a ponytail. Right. Right, right. My daughter once asked me if, Dad, were you a hippie? And, I, <laughs> and that was from college. I think she was drunk dialing me. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I said, well, define a hippie. Oh yeah, uh, I never yeah made it to Woodstock. Okay, uh -huh. thought about it, never never made it. Um, let's see, class of seventy two in high school, right? Class of seventy one. Seventy one. Okay, class of seventy one, and then um, what else? Uh, military history has always been a hobby of mine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I love history. Um, I've traveled, you know, uh, several continents. Um, I've portrayed, uh, done living history recreations, helped build a an 18th century village called Eastfield Village in upstate New York uh, with with the guy, Don Carpenter, Rick, God rest his soul, great guy who was assembling buildings in the 1970s and 80s and 90s as they were being knocked down for turnpike development. He would disassemble them, put them in his little red pickup truck and take them to a corner of his father's farm 
and uh, you know, had a tinsmith shop, a blacksmith shop, a meeting house, a tavern. Oh, really? You know, original, everything original. I mean, wow. it, these were like pieces of history, like going to Sturbridge Village or what town? Williamsburg. It's in Eastfield. It's called Eastfield Village in Eastfield, New York. If we went there today, we'd still see this place? Yes, you would. Wow. It's still being, it's, it's, a, it's turned into a school. Um, to teach 18th century and 19th century crafts and trades. Now, the thing you're most proud of happened recently, right? Uh, my granddaughter, well, that's one of my proud ones. My my granddaughter was born on the 30th of November, but you know, Congratulations. Her, her big big brother will be five come March 2nd. That's true. You have two, right? So I have I have two, and I'm proud of you know, of of both of them. That's right. That kind of thing. Um, yeah, you know, two great kids myself, you know, uh, a son and a daughter, Stephen and, and Jennifer. You know, Stephen is off in, uh, in Madison, living in Madison and working with the uh, U.S. Army, doing Homeland Security type work. And then, uh, you yeah, know, my daughter is working for what used to be Major League Baseball Advanced Media, recently became part of uh, Disney, um, doing project engineering you know, for them in uh Chelsea Market in uh, Manhattan, living in Brooklyn. What and she you? says, Bridgeport's the next Brooklyn. That's what I wanted to ask you. Bridgeport. What is it about Bridgeport that maybe still gives you confidence and hope that there's a, a lot to look forward to? You know what? I'm a very simple person. Um, you know, I, I don't really play politics. You know, it's not my game kind of thing. You know, I think through my life, I've enjoyed doing things, getting things done, whether that's working with my hands on a piece of furniture, whether that's playing this silly little 12-inch tubular wooden musical instrument, which is very simple, or whether it's writing a grant for a state or federal you know, project and building roads and ballparks and arenas and, and everything else. And I think the one thing that's always I've, I've had is faith in people. Um, and I've met a lot of good people in Bridgeport. Um, I've met a lot of people, not a lot. I've met some people that I wish I never did meet. Okay. But you know what? That's part of life. Mm -hmm. um, and what gives me faith is the caliber of the people who are here and are doing different things here. As Nancy Hadley, who is our economic development director at one time, would say, you know, Bridgeport's got good bones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and it's got you know. So we had all these pieces of development going. On. It's just a matter of pulling them all together. That's where we're at now. Yeah, pulling and it all together. Pulling it all together, and that's where you know when the opportunity with Steel Point, I'm going. Okay, I got a 52 acre canvas. Wow, that's a lot. And then we ended up buying, you know, uh, through an RFP process, another 40 acres across the way at the old Carpenter Tech site. You know, kind of kind of thing. Uh, so we have, you know, almost 100 acres on Bridgeport Harbor. We've got, you know, a, we've established a boat works over there, which is a, a marine boat yard. So we'll have commercial or recreation boats. That gets into project. Right. So right. anyway, it gave me an opportunity to continue to build things, to do things that I was comfortable doing, that I was, um, that I enjoyed doing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I turned 65 this year. I could retire. Mm -hmm. Why? Right. I'm having fun. You like what you're doing. And I, and I think that there's a lot of other people who you know, are having fun doing what they're doing, and they're helping to make Bridgeport a better place. And, yeah, it's a struggle, but, oh, well, life is a struggle every day. You can, every time you get up out of bed, it's, it's, it's a struggle. It's not the kind of struggle that my parents went through when uh, they lived through World War II in, uh, in Poland. So. Well, well, Steve, uh, thank you for that. Um, you're right. Uh, what your parents went through paved the way for you, and you're paving the way for your children. And God bless you and your family. Thank you for joining us. And what the audience doesn't know is that Steve came here for something different. We had a meeting plan for today, <laughs> and I pulled him in, and so he's our first guinea pig. I mean, our first guest. <laughs> All right, so thanks, Steve, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Ryan, Frank, thanks. Thanks, guys. Good luck on the, uh, on the pods. The preceding podcast, Bridgeport Stories, was sponsored by PSEG Power Connecticut. PSEG is committed to the communities they serve, transforming the way we think about energy by building systems that use less to promote environmental sustainability and a bright future together. Visit BridgeportHarborStation.com for more information.